Welcome to February 2021. Many things were discovered in this month, and surprisingly, many things were published in just the first half as well. At first, I didn't find any immediate standouts, but as I dug deeper, I kept finding really interesting things, and couldn't help myself but bring them up. You've hopefully just come from the Curious Archive and Paleoanalysis' videos for January. Don't forget to watch my introduction to know how this Paleo Rewind 2021 thing is going down. Ground Sloth Chainmail Ground sloths are some of the weirdest animals around. They had really messed up skulls, walked on the sides of their feet, had short, ultra-muscular tails, and big, wide, bowl-shaped hips that were the widest parts of their bodies. On top of that, many had internal body armor. A new study by a team of Argentinian paleontologists Nestor Toledo, Alberto Boscaini, and Leandro Martin Perez used x-rays to analyze a section of preserved ground sloth hide to figure out the hows and whys of the armor that lay beneath the skin. Osteoderms are lumps of bone that form within the skin. They push through the skin and any large scales lying above the bone. As they grow, the keratin scutes laying atop the skin becomes a cap over the bony core. This is what you find in crocodilians, dinosaurs, lizards, and more, but not quite what is seen in ground sloths. They have balls of bone that remain under the skin with no scales or scutes over top them. This means the bony balls wouldn't have been visible on the outside of the animal. This is partially why the bones beneath the skin of the ground sloths are called dermal ossicles. The team found through the x-rays that this particular ground sloth, belonging to the Mylodontidae family, had ossicles arranged in different patterns. They have different morphologies, sizes, and are organized into rosettes, stars, and rows, or are unorganized or even absent in some areas. This arrangement of dermal ossicles is like what has been seen in other ground sloths where skin is preserved, so that's good news. The team also sliced some of the ossicles into thin microscope slide-ready chips to do a little histology. We love to do a little histology. Histology being the study of the microscopic structures of tissues. It tells you a lot about how bones do be kinda bony. From there, one can infer and confirm possible biological functions for those bony bits. In this instance, the team came up with some hypotheses on why these specific types of ground slots may have had their bony bits, thanks to slicing and dicing them bony bits. They may have used them for armor, that's the obvious answer, but there's a possibility they were used for regulating the animal's body temperature, which is seen in the armor of armadillos and crocodilians, as well as sexually dimorphic armor so that males could do some wrestling without giving each other big ouchies. New Cambrian Lagerstadt from Africa Lagerstadt are special rock deposits that preserve most of the soft tissues of organisms and are known from all over the world. Old ones from before the time of land dwellers are exceptionally important, as most animals around during the Cambrian didn't have hard parts that could easily fossilize. These are some of the only ways to get an idea of what kinds of critters preceded the critters with bones. Guess what? A brand new Lagerstadt site has been found and described from Morocco. This one dates to the early Cambrian, and so far a bunch of exceptionally preserved trilobites, some brachiopods, and hyoliths have been described. Many more are yet to be prepared and described, so hopefully we'll get a new picture of the Cambrian from this site. Freshwater trilobites? Trilobites are the most common parts of Paleozoic marine ecosystems. They're everyone's favorite fossil to collect and are known in the thousands of species. They lasted longer than the dinosaurs and come in every variation on a roly-poly body plan possible. That being said, they all seem to come from saltwater habitats. No one has ever found incontrovertible proof of trilobites taking on the freshest of fresh waters. That was until a new study by Maria Mangano and friends, which found uncontroversial trace and body fossils of trilobites living in brackish water. True, that ain't fresh water, but it's as close as the fossil record has ever shown. These trilobites therefore had to be tolerant to changes in salinity as they made use of tide-dominated estuaries. How Dome Heads Grow Pachycephalosaurs are often overlooked, this is probably because you can count the only good specimens on your hand. 
The easiest part of their bodies to fossilize were their dome-shaped skulls. But even then, only the hardest part, the dome, survived the fossilization process the best. To that end, there are a good number of pachycephalosaurians known, mostly, if not entirely, from domes. One of those dome taxa is Spherotholus, a small pachycephalosaur known from specimens from New Mexico, Montana, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, Canada. These specimens are pretty much all domes, but enough of those domes have been preserved to not only differentiate them from other pachycephalosaurians, but themselves as well. Three species have been named, Spherotholus, Goodwinai, Bucolce, and Edmontonensis. A brand new paper sought to analyze, organize, and better understand the way these animals grew, and whether they all really belonged to their own species, or if they are all bones that belong to the same type of animal. To do this, they used morphometrics, a technique which involves tracking the major points on the skull digitally. They used histology, a technique involving looking at and describing the characteristics of the bone under a microscope slide after slicing the bone into slide-worthy chips. Finally, they used phylogenetic analyses through the computer to relatively accurately place all three known species and all specimens in a family tree. The ontogenetic assessment of the fossils, or figuring out what characteristics of the bones change as the animal ages, found that all the specimens of the Bukholtse species confirm the previously observed changes of the animal as it grew. The dome gets bigger and more solid as the animal aged. Their phylogeny found that all three species were valid and that the Edmontonensis and Bukholtse species were grouped together with the Goodwinai species as a sister to that group. Thai Spinosaurs a team of paleontologists including Adun Samathi, P. Martin Sander, and Fornfin Chanthasit described a bunch of dinosaur tailbones which were found at Phu Vyang Mountain, Thailand. These vertebrae were found to most closely resemble those of Baryonyx, and it nested with the Spinosaurids. These remains have been referred to as a Phu Vyang Spinosaurid B, but are too fragmentary for the authors to fully name them. There is another Spinosaurid known from Thailand, that being Siamosaurus. The authors of this new study suggest that it is possible these new Spinosaurid fossils, those of Fuvyang Spinosaurid B, may belong to Siamosaurus. Siamosaurus itself is known from even less remains than this Fuvyang Spinosaur, but together, it may help to piece together what kind of animal Siamosaurus is. With the new material, the authors decided to re-review another possible Spinosaur, Camariasaurus from Spain. Their analysis found that Camariasaurus and Fuvyang Spinosaurid B may be closely related due to some shared characteristics. If Camariasaurus isn't a Spinosaur, then it may be some form of Megalosauroid, which the Spinosaurids are derived from. The new description here of a possible second Spinosaur in Thailand adds evidence to the idea that multiple Spinosaurs living in the same region and time is common for Cretaceous ecosystems. This means that the many Spinosaurs of North Africa and Europe make some sense. Freshwater Sea Monsters? James Campbell, Mark Mitchell, Michael Ryan, and Jason Anderson published a paper on the trunk and partial flippers of a freshwater plesiosaur. They named it Fluvionectes sloane from a specimen collected from freshwater rock deposits from Alberta, Canada. Plesiosaur remains have been found in this area and from freshwater deposits for almost a hundred years, but have never been complete enough to name or fully describe. Therefore, little attention has been paid to them. All the known plesiosaur remains from this area may belong to this new Fluvionectes, but are just too fragmentary to give a good identity to at this time. That's been my video for Paleo Rewind 2021. Next up is Dylan DeWitt from Paleo Archive. He will be doing the next half of February. Make sure to mosey on over to his channel to see that. You can see the full schedule through my Paleo Rewind 2021 introduction video with a link in the description, comment section below, and at the end of this video. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger. 
as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.